pleasure of repeating a sermon that he gave in 1979. The title is Moses is Dead from Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 and 2a. And it says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Amen. We read of a terrible calamity that Moses, my servant, is dead. Have you ever received bad news? News that made you and your heart sing? Moses, we could have spared anyone better than him. Moses was more than a dozen or any hundred or a thousand men. Moses was Israel's leader. He seemed the one man of all the vast multitudes that could not possibly be spared. And yet, we read, Moses is dead. Why? He was the man who began the great enterprise of emancipation, of delivering us from bondage and slavery. Moses it was who had seen the burning bush in the wilderness and had heard God's call to deliver his people. He it was who had gone a lone old man to invade Egypt with only his staff in his hand and God in his heart. It was Moses who had fought with a hard-hearted king and had won and had led forth Israel from slavery. When the free Israelites were upon the borders of the Red Sea and the Egyptians were behind them on their chariots and the sea was before them, it was this same great man, Moses, who smote the waters. It was Moses who, under God's command, had made a path for their feet. It was Moses who had led them safe to the other side. When they were parching with thirst in the wilderness, it was Moses who had smitten the rock and changed it into a gushing spring. When they had fought the enemy, it was the uplifted hands of Moses that brought them victory. Yes, Moses had been everything to them. However, when he was gone for just 40 days, they said, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. Exodus 32, 23. What then they meant by that was that because Moses had stood for them in the place of God, he had carried them upon his broad shoulders for almost half a century. His passing from them was a loss so devastating to their childish mind, it seemed like a loss of God himself. However reluctant we are to admit it, however bitter the loss, however seemingly disastrous the calamity, the fact remains Moses is dead. This great leader, this man we depended upon, this man we looked up to, this man we took our questions to is dead. Now, facts are to be uh, faced. We are not to shut our eyes to them. We are to look at them squarely and shape our conduct accordingly. But then, there came this very stern command to Moses in Deuteronomy 32, 48 to 50. And he says, And the Lord spake unto Moses that self same day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab that is over against Jericho, and behold, the land of Canaan. 
which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession, and die in the mount, whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hall, and were gathered unto his people. Amen. So Moses left the task unfinished. The last chapter of his book was never written. The last touch was never given to his great masterpiece. His great heart failed, and his life went out just before he reached the goal. Moses is dead. He died without reaching Canaan, the promised land. If he could not bring us into that land, there is no use for anyone else to try. There is no other man among us as great as Moses. There is none other gifted with his patience, his faith, his daring, and his generous. Moses is dead. Therefore, let us quit. Let us give it all up. Let us come back to Egypt and go to our previous bondage. This is an attitude we assume in the presence of the dead Moses of our lives so often. We have met one great defeat. We are wounded to one by one great sorrow. We saw by the coffin of our dead Moses. And we say, life can never be worthwhile again. There can never be any hope for us anymore. They buried my grandfather and stated that only he was equipped to teach this word of God. Mind you, this sermon, 1979, written by Pastor James A. Clark, not me. Only he, Pastor A. Clark, by the way, is also, his name is also James Andrews Clark, the second. The first James A. Clark was the captain, which um, some of us know. So, um, the third pastor, James A. Clark, is uh, is someone we read. Only he had all his all the lives. He is now gone. No one can take his place. He will have. I will have to read his sermons to continue his legacy. None alive today can compare with him. We cannot preach or teach. Many said this very thing when my father died, which is uh, Pastor Henry Franklin Clark. Some members in the church, very strong and faithful members during my father's <coughs> ministry, when he died, their Moses was dead. They stated, what will we do? To whom can we go with our problems? Who? To whom can we go uh, with our problems? Who can give us spiritual help? Their Moses was dead. Because of this loss, they slowly drifted from church attendance with us and for many years, now have not carried on any fellowship in the church or with true believers in worship. They gave up their enthusiasm for the church and others followed. They have stayed home and read sermons and played recorded sermons of my late father, their Moses. They have sat down and nursed their sorrow and broken hearts. Now, that is one way to treat our dead Moses, but that is not the way that is not the best way, and that is not God's way for us as true believers. Those Israelites, when Moses uh, was taken from them, they might have rebelled, and they had done so often in the past. They might have become morose and bitter. They might have blamed God for taking Moses from them, just as you sometimes blame God for the loss of your some Moses that slips out of your life. A lost soul is a pathetic human being. For your Moses to die in vain is tragic indeed. And yet, it happens time and again. But God's way is best, always best. What is this call? What is this blessed invitation? Again, we go back.
back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 2. It's at Moses, my servant's death. And what is the next thing? Now, therefore, rise and go. That is verse 2 b. Since this great earthly leader is gone, you will be all the more needed. Since Moses is dead, he can no longer carry on the work. Your work is all the more necessary now. Let the vacancy that he left be an invitation to you to fill it. Moses is dead, says the faint-hearted coward. I will quit. We will never get anywhere without Moses. That is exactly what some members said after the death of my father, referencing Pastor Henry Clark. They are Moses. Moses is dead, says the heroic Joshua. I must take on new bodies. I must assume new responsibilities. I must fight much harder because Moses is dead. That was God's plan then. It is God's plan now. Therefore, rise and go. Go because God has to have some man to lead. God can manage the seasons and the sun and the stars without us. But there is one something he cannot do without us. He cannot save the world without our evangelism. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Luke 24, 46 to 48. And that is an undertaking that lies close to God's heart. When God wants to change water into wine, when he wants to bring about a reformation, when he wants to revive a dead religion or church, when he wants to change a moral graveyard into a parade of ground, or a parade ground for the king's army, he must have willing men to do this, and let us add women to it. But while God works through men, we need to remember that no one man is essential to this success of his enterprise. God can take his work men home to heaven and still carry on his work. It is a good thing for us to face that part over and over. For we are prone, all of us, to think that the coming of the kingdom depends upon this or that individual. We do not believe Canaan can ever be one without Moses. We fancy that he, Moses, is to give us, is to give to us. When God tells and uh, keeps telling us that He Himself is a giver, Exodus 6 4. Remember when He said, I have given you this land. So God gives. We believe the young prophets of Jericho thought that Elijah is the one necessary for the carrying on of God's plans and purposes in the world. 2 Kings 2 5 and 15. We think. What we need today is the good old preachers and the good old people of 50 years ago. Now, people were needed then, but they are not essential to God's purpose in the world today. No man is essential. Every man is expendable. Sometimes we see this beautiful sight. A man is a member of the church. He may even be an elder in the church, maybe in some way, his feelings get hurt. Maybe he fancies that the preacher could be doing better. He finally decides to leave the church. His position as an elder and practically wrecks the church by quitting and he takes others with him. This has happened. So he withdraws and is no longer seen in God's house. What happens? What? Does the church die? No. The church does not die. The man himself dies, and in dying, he helps his family to come to despise the church that he himself once loved and that he really loves today. In spite of his personal resentment against the preacher and his methods. But I say, beloved, if you find yourself wounded, don't let it hurt lead you into that supreme madness of quitting. Don't become so possessed with a sense of your importance that you fancy the church of God will be broken up because you go off and part. You and 
die. And a thousand others will quit this moment. And the church of God will go on by the grace of God. And the redeemed will shout on. And we will discover that we are in no way, in no sense, sentient. Sure, God blessed the church with great leaders in the past. Thank God for using them to enlighten us. God needs you and me. God must have men. But no one man is essential. After the death of my father, those who were so loyal to him felt they must be disloyal to me. Then what got around? So and so is going to quit, uh, quit the church. They felt that my father was the only one qualified to teach and preach, and they depended upon him totally for encouragement and in total faith. And they did not think I could possibly take his place. To them, Moses was dead. No, none of us is essential. Our elder died. The Lord God Almighty alone is essential. Matthew, I am not saying that we are not needed. God has nothing to throw away. You and I have nothing to throw away. However rich we may be in moral work, we don't have one single hour or day or ounce of moral energy to squander. Even Christ himself, when he fed the multitude, ordered that the fragments be gathered up in order that nothing might be lost. Matthew 14, 17 to 21. The eternal God himself lost no single cross of bread, and certainly no single human soul to throw away. But while we need to remember that we are needed, we need also to realize that none of us is absolutely essential to the carrying on of God's plan in the world. Our almighty heavenly Father and Jehovah, I say alone, is essential, and he abides. Joshua 1, 1 says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Did you notice that? That word? God spoke after, even after the death of Moses. It is hard for us to believe it is easy for us to believe that God spoke to Moses. We all agree. It is easy for us to believe that God made known his will to the men of the far of yesterday. But what we need to realize is that God also speaks to men of today. We need to realize that God did not lose his interest in humanity with the ongoing of Moses. God spoke long ago after the death of Moses. And after the death of every Moses, God still abides and still bends low to speak into the ear that is attentive to hear. So God not only spoke to Moses, but he also spoke to Thor, commonplace Joshua. He spoke to the man who had occupied no higher position than that servant of Moses. God spoke to a man who seemed good only at taking orders. And what did God encourage Joshua with? Joshua 1, 5 says, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Amen. God told Joshua that he was not willing to walk with Joshua as he was to walk with Moses. God told him what he tells you and me, that just as God was with Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Samuel and Paul and Peter and John, so is he willing to be with us who fight our battles in the common place here and now. How? Listen to this hymn. Just as God who reigns on high speaks to men in his combat, so the Lord is calling men today. And my brother, this is true, whatsoever this is doing. There is but one thing to do, just obey. Just obey, just obey, just obey, just obey. Is the way God's way the only way? If you are in the Savior's hands, you must do as 
church there is face to face with much that is discouraging. Many an enemy must be met and conquered in the power of the Holy Spirit before the kingdom can be brought in. We face the fact that only a little more than one third of the people, even of this so called Christian country, belong to any church or profess to be Christian. In every church or gathering, there are some seed that falls on the wayside. There are some seed that falls on the stony ground or stony places. Some among the thorns and some on the good ground that brings forth 30, 60, 100 fold. Matthew 13, 3 to 9. We face the further fact that of those who do belong, a distressingly large number of Christians are in name only. We are not the mighty force that we ought to be. We are not going forth, conquering and to conquer as we ought to go. Amen. Revelation 6 2. We are not fair as the moon and bright as the sun and terrible as an army with banners. Son of Solomon, chapter 6. Verse 10. The enemy has made inroads, and our walls in many places have been broken down. What is to be your attitude as you face these facts? Maybe the church, even our own, and any other church, is struggling to survive to a large extent. Maybe too many in the church have a form of godliness. Uh, Amen. Second Timothy 3 5. What do we do? Will you give up and quit? Or will you let the great me summon you to service? For the church to fail at its peak, at a high peak, is a calamity. Will you not allow the thought of that failure? Make you steer yourself to a new effort to dare you something for the sake of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God can make it possible for us to change our pains into sounds, our losses into gains, and our calamities into capital. And then one day, what will you say? Therefore, remember. That no failure needs the final of failure. Remember that no loss need be without remedy. Moses may die, but God lives on. And while we have to hold on, uh, to hold on this hand, we have hold on, on life and victory and eternal progress. Therefore, even though Moses, God's servant, is dead. Let us all rise and go over our Jordan, where the best hopes of our lives are waiting to be realized. <coughs> May this message energize us all to serve God with comfort, hope, and obedience, and to encourage others to do just that. I pray that God will bless us all through this message. Amen. By the way, I want to say that I have known uh, our late head pastor for 36 years. He started grooming me uh, unknowingly uh, in the 90s, asking me to read letters written to him from Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, and analyzing it and then reporting to him what I felt. And uh, I didn't know that he was preparing me. And then um, suddenly, one day, he 
He wrote a letter in response to one of those letters. This one he didn't give to me to read. It was after he sent it that he sent me copies and said, it's finished to all the pastors in Nigeria and Ghana and Togo and all that and those uh, here. And I'm sure some of us may have forgotten the letter. That was written in 1999. And in that letter, I was not a pastor. I was only a brother helping me uh, in church and doing what I was in. In that letter, it says, if the Lord should call him, the letter is still available and it's available to anyone in the It says, if the Lord should call him, 1999, the person who should leave the church is Brad Joshua, some, but he lives 200 miles away. And so I didn't know it uh, then. And God has been working, and uh, of all service with him. He has been a father to me. He brought me many, many uh, nuggets of Christian theology that made me to keep certain scriptures. You know, many other things. I think one other thing that I should mention that he was also a cartoonist. Uh, in, uh, you know, and he's also uh, giving me a lot of information. I mean, so much information about uh, his involvement uh, when he was the contributor of Jericho. I actually had the card. He sent me the card, which they gave him uh, the exemption as a contributor of Jericho class four. He gave it to me to have it. So he has given me so much information over the years that I'm just humbled that uh, I have this opportunity to present what I'm presenting. At the same time, I want to say to the Clark family, I'm eternally grateful uh, to, you, uh, to you for inviting me to speak. And I pray that the Lord, who comforts all of us, will continue to comfort you. I'm not going to read First Thessalonians 4, uh, 13 to 18, because we already know it, but God's comfort already uh, will be with you, and he has led a wonderful life. All of you know it. So a hundred life, a hundred years, is not a joke. And everything that has been said about him, you know, is 100% true. And he has, you know, I have loved him and I have uh, maybe sacrificed too much. I have assisted as much as I could in all situations. In the night, in the evening, in the morning, all that, on telephone calls and uh, one time, you know, uh, his computer. You know, and he said, oh, this is a problem, uh, help me. And I'll say, push, can you push, uh, print you? And he said, what is that? And I said, uh, on your screen, you know, at that time, you know. And I was patient because I needed to help him to solve a situation which he was facing. So it is not, I'm not here to pose, I'm not here to uh, do anything. And that is why I wanted uh, his voice to speak to us. It is case sermon, his voice. And he was speaking then in 1979. And so, uh, of course, I read scripture of execution, he said, he loved the Lord. And everything he preached has helped me to be on a level where, by God's grace, through the grace of God. And if I can quote Joshua again this time, uh, that as for me and my family, by the grace and the mercy of God, the power of the Holy Spirit it is to serve the Lord. May the Lord continue to bless each of you and also to grant you eternal life which we all believe we already have. May God be with you all. Thank you.